I want to give a big thank you to all my patrons, and I'll be doing a Kingsguard roll call after today's video. Welcome back to the Fantasy Network, everyone. My name is, of course, Jimmy Nuts, and today we're going to be doing a no-spoiler review for The Ninth Reign by Jen Williams. This is book one in the Winnowing Flame trilogy and was in my top eight I think it was eight, <laughs> Need to Read in 2022. This was published in 2017, and it won the Fantasy Award for Britain in 2018, I believe. Even though it has won awards, and see, people who have read it seem to be very high on it, it's not one that is overtly popular uh, within at least the booktube sphere in definitely in America. And that's because it hasn't had a widespread release here in the United States yet. So there's a lot of readers that this has just kind of flown under the radar. Uh, I do believe that the third book is now at least on Audible in some facet. And I've heard rumblings that they might become available. Like they weren't even available on Kindle. I had to order mine from Book Depository. Also pretty cool cover, by the way. I like it. It's pretty neat. Um, but yeah, my whole goal with this book and being on my must read for 2022 was the fact that I really wanted to find an undiscovered gem. And I'd had this personally recommended to me by my friend Stuart. So Stuart shouts out to you. I appreciate you. And I'd also seen other reviewers, booktubers, YouTubers, or whatever talk about this as something that probably needs a little bit more notoriety. I wanted to jump into it. I heard it was fast paced. I heard the world building was really cool. And for mostly, most of those both points, I think they're true. Um, and my experience might vary from uh, some other people, but I wanted to cover this because I do think that there are, there's a large audience for this book out there. I think a lot of people, especially people who enjoy the more modern takes on fantasy that are fast paced and moving, could really get into this. Uh, Jen Williams seems like a very competent author and it's a nice to know that if you enjoy this book, she has tons of other stuff available. She has like a Copper Cat trilogy and I think something else. So she is very active and uh, is definitely still churning out work. So if this is a hit for you, you're going to be in store for a whole bunch more. And that's great. But let's talk about what the Ninth Reign is all about. So Ninth Reign, to put it simply, is a world in turmoil. <laughs> and there are multiple races. I mean, you have your typical, prototypical humans, and then you have a bit of like an elder race called the Aborans. And they have this amazing tree in Abora where they're from. And this tree has been their lifeline for ages and ages and ages. And then you have the Jorelia, which are a worm type threat <laughs> that are, it's this existential threat, right? Like an apocalypse type of event that happens. And they call them the Rains. So so the Aborns were able to harvest uh, creatures. I don't want to give away too much because some of the mystery is actually in the world building. But uh, these creatures come from the tree. They call it a rain. And then there's a battle for, you know, this planet and yada, yada, yada. So that's happened, obviously, eight times. Um, Ninth Rain is also the name of a sword, which is interesting in the story. But that's kind of the setup. And then you do have um, some magic. There's witches in the world. Um, and the whole thing is kind of set up as this eldritch horror type fantasy. And it is pretty dark. I would almost say that it does verge into, uh, you know, being very scary at times. And it's very dark. Even the humor is there. There's definitely a ton of humor in the book, but it is also dark as well. So just generally overall, it does feel dark, but not in the sense of like being overly grim or disgusting or anything like that. But it's just like this world sucks to live in, I would imagine, knowing that these big worm things are going to come in these flying like behemoth ships and kill you at any moment. <laughs> so that's probably not the best place to live. But overall, I'm here for that eldritch type fantasy. And I think it is executed rather well within the Ninth Reign. Um, one of the biggest things that you'll see is that the conflict's not just the existential threat, but it's also like the world in general seems to be very uninhabitable and there's a lot of really dangerous areas. But even more danger within the relationships between, say, the Aborans and the humans, uh, even with the existential threat looming, they still cannot seem to get along. And the tree that has given them life for so very long, I, it's not Yggdrasil, but I want to say it is, um, you know, it's kind of based on the same idea, but it, it gives them their life sap, right? But this tree has ceased to produce that. So unfortunately, the Aborans did the next best thing. They said, sap's all sold out at the store. What do we else we got, honey? What do we got at home? Human blood. Of course. So they kind of feed on human blood. Uh, there was a bit of a conflict about that back in the day, and there's a whole lot of prejudice left over from that. And uh, they don't like each other too much. So with all these conflicts, there's a lot of interpersonal workings together, like trying to get ready for this threat, but they don't get along. So that starts to edge into the territory of you know, uh, frenemies, if you will. And that can land at varying degrees, but it is very much present 
in this book. So with the interpersonal conflicts, with the existential threat, there's a lot to latch on to here. And that's one of the reasons why I do think that this is a book that could land with a lot of people. I happen to really love existential threats in fantasy. If that is a premise within the book, I'm probably going to be able to latch on to that, and I did here. And this story is told from a third-person, limited perspective at times, but there will be random scenarios where just like a third-person omniscient sentence is thrown in. So it is kind of being narrated to you. Uh, it doesn't really tell you who is narrating it because you are getting into the characters' heads at times, so you just kind of have to go with the flow on that. One of the things that I really, really liked about this book, though, was they had epigraphs at the beginning of some of the chapters, maybe every chapter. I think in book two, it starts to be like not every chapter, but there's a character named Vintage who is kind of like our scholarly type character, which I'm a big fan of that archetype. And she's giving journal entries. She's not only just talking about things that she's discovering and learning, but also letters home to the people she cares about. So it's like between journal entries and letters, and I'm a big fan of that. In fact, I would say if this book had been just from that perspective, and that was the gimmick behind it, is that there are just letters of a scholar in this um, really cool world, I think I would have loved this book. Um, unfortunately, that was not the case because, you know, there's actually another narrative going on, but I love the epigraphs. So if you're a fan of kind of that journaling narrative um, in the epigraphs of books, you're going to enjoy that a lot. Um, from that third person perspective, we get a vast, uh, you know, cast. I was trying not to rhyme there. Vast cast, whatever. We have Vintage, of course, who I kind of already mentioned, who ends up hiring an Aboran named Tormelin the Oathless. Uh, and because he's an Aboran, that kind of gives that a whole different vibe within the group because then they get joined by a fugitive who has been held against her will because she carries magical power. She has the winnowing fire within her. Um, and that's kind of, and she's human. So that's where you get a little bit of the bickering on and on and on between those two. Uh, but I will say this, it makes a lot of sense of why they would bicker considering the history between uh, the Aborans and the humans here. And also, unfortunately for Noon, who is the witch uh, that ends up joining the group, you know, Noon, she's had it tough. You know, she's been in prison, but no, yeah, but basically borderline tortured. Or really, she was tortured. And uh, it's not surprising that she's a little bit prickly, uh, that she is very slow to trust people in the story. But I do think that the, like, the balance between Vintage, Noon, and Tourmaline as a whole works really, really well. And even though there is a lot of infighting uh, between Tourmaline and Noon, it does work. Uh, and I see what Jen Williams was going for whenever she brought this group together and made this uh, the group that we would follow. So like overall, I do think the characters stand out. I think they're all very distinct. I think they all have clear motivations and their backstories make sense for how they're acting, all this stuff, right? However, it is not my favorite. The infighting and bickering to me at times felt just a little bit much. It kind of reminds me like in Wheel of Time. Uh, Wheel of Time... <laughs> Wheel of Time has a lot of bickering between friends. And yes, I know that happens with people and whatnot. I'm not saying it's unrealistic, but I don't always enjoy that uh, dynamic. It can be done in a, in a way that I will enjoy it, but it was not done in that way here. So I ended up feeling like the characters were just a little bit too exaggerated for me, especially with their dialogue back and forth. I never really got into any of the dialogue. Uh, and the characters, none of them felt like beloved to me. Vintage was pretty great, uh, but even her story that's outside of the epigraphs uh, never really took off, right? Never got me like really, really into it. But she does drive a lot of the world building here and a lot of the exposition. And that is where, in my opinion, the story really comes together. The eldritch horror style fantasy, um, just, uh, I don't know. I really like this world. It's probably one of my more favored modern world building fa fantasy. It's nothing super original. It's not into the point where I'm like, this is world class or this is genre defining or changing or anything like that. But it's just really, really good. She had a really clear idea of what she wanted to go for in this world and she executed it very well in my opinion. And I like the fact that she leans into uh, not just the horror stuff, but like also just things that on a micro scale we don't really think about as humans. Like, for instance, the, you know, ant colonies and stuff. There's kind of a mirror to that within the enemy of the Jorelia, who are also kind of worm-like. And if you think about like how nature interacts around us, and we don't consider because it it's on the micro, and you have the time to take that and think about it in the macro, it would be absolutely horrifying if ants were like the size of bears. Like think about that for a second, or even bigger, right? So I like the fact that there's like this nature feel and it's like nature's dangerous. It's not just 
glorified into the fact that like, look how beautiful everything is, like most epic fantasy. It's like, this is dangerous and they, this nature doesn't like us. <laughs> it's not here to kill us. So like with all of the world building, um, just set up like that, I really, really dig the vibe that I got from the Ninth Ring. And this part kind of reminds me a little bit of Brandon Sanderson because one of the things that Sanderson does extraordinarily well when he writes books is that a lot of the plot is like clouded in mystery that we have to figure out with the characters as they learn new things about the world. So sure, there's exposition. Sure, there's characters relaying dialogue back and forth, but the world's not solved yet and there's still some mysteries. So a lot of the mysteries in the world building drove me to be more interested in what was happening in the actual story. But I just kind of wanted to see what else was out there. Like I wanted to explore more of the world and that's what kept me really in tune. Also we'll say though, is that whenever you have this mystery and the plot's a little bit clouded and you're moving towards some sort of angle, but you're not sure, to tie that all together into a great package, in my opinion, you have to have a cast of characters that rounds that out, that they can be the vehicle in which they discover the world that I want to get into. And I just never got there with this cast of characters. And that's not to say I think the characters are bad. Some people are gonna read this and think it's hilarious. They're gonna like the infighting and the bickering and the sharp jabs at one another because there are times where it works. Uh, but there were times also where it felt a little bit stiff, it felt a little bit cringe to me. And that's just a personal subjective thing. However, whenever you have these big mysteries and there's this big unveiling and stuff, like those moments need to deliver. You really need to deliver. And I think that's what separates like the good from the great. And whenever it came time to kind of cash out on the buildup and the mystery and the, this world that she set up, I just felt like it was a little too rushed at points. Uh, and like I said, a little stiff. But I do love where the world is going. So when I finished book one, I said, you know, that was pretty good and I'd like to continue. So I did start book two. Um, I've put it on the shelf for now. I'm not gonna call it a DNF, but I need to come back to this whenever I'm in the mood for a little bit more fast paced, um, straightforward fantasy. This isn't a book that I sat down with and I really thought about the themes of it, though they are there, um, especially with Noon. I think Noon as a character, there, there's a lot of analysis that could be done there for everything that she's been through, for the power that she has and the relationships that she's forming now that she's no longer a captive. Like that's quality stuff. And Jen Williams is obviously competent enough to write that story. Um, it's just whether or not I'm in the mood to read it, right? This is a book I need to be in the mood for. So the next time I want Eldritch Fantasy, fast paced, I'm probably going to go ahead and jump into book two. But for right now, I'm kind of on pause. And I always like to try to comment on the style of the writing and the writing in itself. And Jen Williams writing never got in the way of the story. It also wasn't like overly stylized wherever I felt like, man, like this is the only time I'll read a book like this. Um, so it's not overly stylized. Some people really like that. They kind of like the, you know, more backseat approach or window pane approach of just getting the story out. If you're into that, you're definitely going to like this. Um, I tend to lean more towards stylized, more stylized writing, um, with, you know, a little bit, a little more to dig into. And I didn't think that that was here, but it's certainly not bad by any means. You can tell she's very, very talented. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind whenever you do pick this book up. So overall, do I think that this is some sort of hidden gem that uh, will change the genre? No, I don't. Do I think it's kind of under the radar in the sense that a lot of people could like this? Yes. I think if you like Adrian Shafkowski, uh, even like maybe Brando Sando to a certain extent, or something that's a little bit more fast paced, like a John Gwen, I think you could really, really enjoy this. I think the central piece of this is the world. Uh, and then the characters will be the X factor uh, whether or not you like it. Uh, if you're into eldritch horror type fantasy, you should definitely give this a shot. And, I, and honestly, it's pretty short um, and it's a low commitment. So I recommend a lot of you would, you know, give this a go. You might wonder, well, like if I didn't love it, cause I would say this book was just okay for me, right? I would say it's pretty good and it had a lot of promise, especially with the lore. Um, but like, why did I decide to talk about this? Well, sometimes whenever a book isn't like a love, or even a hate, and it's right in the middle, you kinda like to argue with yourself, especially on camera, like this. Uh, but I always think of you all, when you're watching this channel, you know, what would the masses think? And I do think that there's a lot of people that will love this book. So I hope that maybe you would give it a shot, um, and you know, it could be your hipster series, cause not a lot of people know about it, right? So you could read it and be like, huh, at least here in America, right? You could be like, oh, uh, there's this series, you probably never heard of it, right? We all like to have those. We all like to be a hipster a little bit. 
don't we? But that's going to wrap up my no spoiler review for the ninth raid by Jen Williams. Uh, to my friend Stuart, I hope you don't hate me because I didn't love it. I did like it. It was fine. I think it'll be a bigger hit with many other people, especially ones that can latch on to the characters. I want to thank you so much for checking out this review. If you found it helpful or enjoyed watching it, hit like. If you didn't like it, you can hit dislike. And if you loved it, think about subscribing. I do tons of book reviews here on the channel, as well as a bookish podcast among spoiler discussions, everything else uh, you can really think of. I hope to be doing some House of the Dragon stuff coming up. That show comes out this week as the time of filming this. And I'm really, really excited. So we have a lot to look forward to on the Fantasy Network. I'd love to have you. I'd be honored if you'd hit the subscribe button. I do have a Patreon in the description. It's optional, but always appreciated. Until I see you next time, be good, be safe. And remember to always keep turning the page. I want to give a big shout out to my Kingsguard, which are my top tier patrons, which include Lauren, Henrik, Kai, Simon, Oscar, Stuart, Josephine, Ikaika, Amanda, who is the lore master, RJ, Shad, Nicoletta, Tanner, Jennifer, Garrick, Frank, Evie, Fever, Jay, Sarah, Pat, Kevin, Ryan, Michael, Terrence, Wade, Darren, My Book is Lit, Derry, John C., Bass, Mitch, Sebastian, Benjamin, Joe Bot, Welcome to My Mind, Noel, Amanda L., and Kyle, and C. Scott. Thank you all so much. You're the best.